On this episode of Latinas, we'll meet the first former dreamer ever elected to the New York State Assembly, Catalina Cruz, find out how many Latinas are earning PhDs, and so much more. And welcome to Latinas, the show that's all about Nuestra Mujeres in the Latinx community. I'm Tina Beth Pina. Today, we're at Calle Dao, one of my favorite Latin restaurants in all of New York City. And I always feel so lucky when I get a chance to eat here. Es riquísimo. I also feel very lucky when I have the opportunity to meet people like my next guest. From living undocumented in this country for more than 10 years to becoming the first dreamer elected to the New York State Assembly, Colombian-born CUNY alum, Catalina Cruz has an amazing story of resilience and love. Let's take a look. How proud are you to be where you're at right now in life? It's, it's a little bit incredible at times. Um, for a very long time, my existence was concentrated in surviving. It wasn't something where I was like, oh, I totally want to be this successful politician one day. It was more like, oh, I want to get through the next week um, with work, with life. And all of a sudden, my life takes this incredible turn. I become this persona where wherever I go in my community, I'm recognized and even outside of my community. And I get to create change for people who like me, we're only concentrated in surviving. Isn't it ironic that you become a citizen in 2009 and 10 years later, you're representing oh, a lot of people? I didn't even realize it. Yeah, 10 years later, look at that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity. It is quite a turn of, of events, quite a turn of my life that I now get to be the person that is gonna help other people become citizens because that's one of the things that I'm gonna do. And how was it for you when you came in 92? You came to Queens? Yes. Queens is one of the most diverse boroughs in the world, with over, what, 130 languages being spoken here. How was it for you coming here from Colombia to here? Was it difficult of a transition? Was it easy? What was it like? I mean, if I think back to when I was nine, um, it was a game. It was a game of, you know, when you're a, a nine-year-old child, a game of learning English, a game of seeing my mom go off to, school, to work, a game of my sisters are born. Everything was just look through the eyes of a child until they were not, until I realized that my mom was working two, three jobs, that my sisters were gonna have the ability to do things I couldn't because they were born here. So how much of an inspiration was your mom to you? She was everything, she's still everything. Um, seeing someone who back in Colombia had a full career and seeing her make the, the very difficult decision to pick up everything, leave her life behind and bring me here, it's what drove me to want to do this work. And so what, what was that moment when you were like, I'm going to do this because that might just be enough? It was election night uh, when the president um, that we have now came into power. I have uh, a mentee who I call my, I had uh, my goddaughter. She's a young Muslim DACA recipient. And I was very fearful because I could already see what was coming. It's been important to you, of course, to declare I am a dreamer. I am the first dreamer in the New York State Assembly. Why? I will tell you that originally that's not something I wanted to do um, because I've always felt like one of the lucky ones, one of the lucky ones that was able to get a citizenship, one of the lucky ones that had no longer has to feel being uh, deported, removed, being torn apart from my family. And so I always carry this amount of guilt about my position now. But when I started to look at the landscape of what was coming our way, I felt uniquely suited to raise that voice, to raise that flag and to say, here's who I am, here's where I came from, and we are here and we're not going anywhere. How did CUNY play a role for you? I've, I've said this in many articles, CUNY saved my life. Um, when I was going to college, I did not, in the beginning necessarily, not see a path. I always thought my path was going to be the Dream Act. 
And once that didn't happen, CUNY still encouraged me. I was able to go to school. I was able to graduate. I went to CUNY John Jay. I went to CUNY Law. So CUNY gave me the opportunity to not become another statistic. And last question, what's next for you? I think what's next is continuing to roll up my sleeves and do the hard work. You know, right now we were working on bringing a mammography van to our neighborhood. We we're working on a health fair. We we're working on a job fair. We we're working on passing legislation um, that deals with the sexual harassment that a lot of the staffers up in Albany face, that a lot of employees face. We're working on legislation to pass uh, driver's licenses for all. We're working on finishing the budget. So it's the work. That's what's happening now. The work to make sure that all of the commitments that I made to my constituents, to my community, are met. Because one of the things that I like to say that differentiates me from politicians is that I don't make promises, I make commitments. Imagine a kind of money that values people over profit, culture and community over material wealth. It's known as a community currency and Puerto Rico is developing its own. Valori Cambio is the brainchild of two Latinas, and Judith Escalona dropped by their ATM for some culture and cash. For many Puerto Ricans, the debt crisis and the aftermath of Hurricane Maria are transformative experiences. The local government and Washington, D.C. failed to adequately respond to their needs. In order to survive and even thrive, Puerto Ricans have been fending for themselves, finding ways to manage the ongoing crisis. Valor y Cambio, or Value and Change, is one of those ways. It's an activist art project that has been printing money and distributing it in Puerto Rico and now in New York. Sounds criminal, even subversive, but it's not. Columbia University professor Francis Negron Muntaner, who created the project with Sarabel Santos Negron, explains. Valor y Cambio is a art, storytelling, and just economy project that seeks to do three things. The first is provide a platform or a space for Puerto Ricans and others living in Puerto Rico and the diaspora to express what they value as a community. The second objective is to introduce the notion of a community currency, which is a type of money that communities can use to meet their own exchange needs. And the third objective of the project was to provide a practice of what a just economy feels like. Community currencies have been around for a long time. There are over 5,000 community currencies operating right now in the world. The U.S. has one of the most famous ones, which is called Ithaca Hours, which is in upstate New York. Ithaca Hours was created in 1991 by a group of local activists to meet the challenge of the economic downturn of the 1990s. For Negron Montaner, Puerto Rico was ready for its own local currency. It's a place where there's uh, high levels of poverty and unemployment, but also high levels of education, knowledge, and skills. So that means that a lot of what Puerto Ricans are capable of is not being a part of the mainstream economy. Puerto Rico uses the U.S. dollar as its currency. Creating a local currency like the Puerto Rican peso would allow people to trade their skills and resources, restoring their local economy. A community can then recognize, value, and organize those resources and skills that are not being part of the mainstream economy for their own benefit. People in the community determine the value of their money based on what they decide is important to them. Then they circulate their pesos by buying and selling among themselves. In this case, the Puerto Rican peso's value has been set by its creators. In exchange of what you tell us about what you value, we'll give you uh, a currency of our making that you can use in an, a number of establishments. In Puerto Rico, we ended with about 40 plus. Here, we are 20 plus so far. Puerto Rican pesos are available to anyone willing to visit the unique traveling ATM machine that dispenses them. For more information, check out their website, valoricambio.org. I'm Judith Escalona for Latinas. Sometimes we're not very comfortable talking to our kids about sex. So we gathered a few Generation Z Latinas to tell us what their mommies did or did not tell them about the birds and the bees. And that's today's Caliente Caliente. My mom and I have never really acknowledged oh, yeah. the whole concept of sex and I'm 20 and you know, it's <laughs> so, wow. like I know what it is. My mom herself was a teen mom, so that also just terrified me in terms of, oh my gosh, I don't wanna, I'm scared of falling down the same path or, 
she also just never really had the talk with me. And I was lucky to have four older sisters to give me that talk. It was just something I never was really aware about, and it was very taboo and negative, and it just terrified me to ever even say the word out loud. I wish I would have heard that sex was okay. I always heard it in a very negative light. Oh, you're going to get pregnant. Just always like a negative light. So for me, I wish my family would have taught me that sexual sex is something natural and it's something that is going to happen and not shun upon it. You know, most Latinas are Catholic. Um, and so we, you know, in the, in the Bible, it says that, you know, sex, don't have sex before marriage. And so I think we still have that in the Latina culture. And it's kind of like shunned upon you if you do have sex mm -hmm. at an early age or before marriage. Yeah. The beginnings of my sexual health education started off with my mom bringing like a pile of books from the library to me. Um, just about puberty, menstruation, and all those things I was going to end up going through at around like eight years old. But after that, I never really heard anything more like what is sex like? How do you have sex? Like, how do you protect yourself if you do engage in, in this type of behavior? So I was really lacking that information. I kind of understood more so, okay, this is my body. This is what changes are about to occur. But when those changes occur and now I'm in these situations, how do I go about being safe? And I really believe that parents are like, the first people that are supposed to expose us to this information. Mm -hmm. But a lot of our parents, at least for me, like my parents don't even know themselves. So how can they educate me? That's like the blind leading the blind <laughs> in this situation, right? Yeah. The big thing is don't get pregnant, don't get pregnant, don't get mm -hmm. pregnant. So like just the one thing is like, okay, or someone thinks, okay, I'm on birth control, I can't get pregnant, and that's it, like close the book. Yep. And then you forget, wait, no, you can get an STD and you can get or, you know, it can be something even greater or more scary like HIV. So I think just that constant fear, okay, don't get pregnant, that's just ingrained in our heads. That we forget about. That we forget about STDs. I didn't know that condoms protected you from HIV, STDs, and AIDS and yeah. all of that. And then I learned about chlamydia and STDs um, when I actually went to the OBGYN one day. Mm -hmm. And I was going through um, some discomfort down in that area mm -hmm. and I was like what's going on and it came back positive for mm -hmm. chlamydia and I was like what is chlamydia and she's like oh it's this sexual transmitted disease you can get it from having sex you could get it from just oral sex um, it doesn't have to be you know like intercourse sex um, mm -hmm. and yeah, you like you you have it. So I was like, all right, am I gonna die? <laughs> like, what's going on, right? Um, and she's like, no, all you have to do is just take this pill, mm -hmm. and you sh will be fine. But I was really, really scared, and I think I was scared because I wasn't educated on it. I didn't know of it, and um, I kind of like looked at myself as like dirty. Now I'm like very careful when I do have sex. I make sure that I always use a condom and stuff, but I also make sure I made sure that I educated myself on it. But it was just sad that I had yeah. to learn from it from experience. Yeah. But I didn't even know either. I didn't know oral sex was something that you can get STDs from. Mm -hmm. And I think so many people too, you forget, okay, so you know, it's not intercourse, so I'm fine, you know, yeah. you're not getting pregnant. So it's everything's looked at as perfectly fine until something like that happens and it's, it's a, it sucks that that has to happen and you have to have to go through that experience because you didn't know. Um, and that's something that could have been so easily avoided, you know what I mean? If we just were educated and op I feel more open yeah, about open it. About it. So, stigmatized yeah. because you're calling someone dirty. No one wants to yeah. be called dirty. Yeah, no one that. wants to be called dirty. And there's nothing dirty with experiencing these things and um, being diagnosed with a certain STD, like there's nothing dirty about it. But it's super important to know that that doesn't define who you are. It's just an experience that you go through mm -hmm. and hopefully you learn from it and move forward in a more educated way. Try to balance. To me the key word is balance because women are always going to care about their families and, and their children or extended family. And sometimes it's hard to find your own time for your own, uh, you know, endeavors and the creative efforts that women do. There are more Latina PhDs in the U.S. than ever before, but they are sorely underrepresented compared to other women. So what's the reason why? Our very own PhD student and correspondent, Elena Romero, has the story.
the doctoral study path is very difficult. And many of us are first generation college students. Many of us are first generation PhD students. So in terms of which path to take, there really hasn't been many people who have taken it before us to help us navigate that path. According to recent studies, only 8% of the Latinx population overall earn a doctoral degree. Unfortunately, of all PhD holders, only 2% are Latinas like Dr. Leiro. Many of our Latinas our, our first generation college students, but also first generation immigrants. And there's also the reality that as immigrants, many of us are low income or we can't afford the process. You know, pursuing a doctoral study uh, degree is very expensive. And then life happens. You start your PhD as a single person, and then maybe along this five to seven to 10 year path, however long it takes a person to get their PhD, they meet someone or life happens and you get little detours along the way and many people don't finish that way, right? This path is not necessarily designed for a person with those that background. For that very reason, finding a support system is key to navigating the PhD landscape. Dr. Leiro is a member of the Latina Researchers Network, an organization founded in 2012 to mentor Latinas pursuing advanced degrees. Why is it important for Latinas to have PhDs? The more of us there are, the more understanding of the different areas of interest that these Latinx are gonna have in higher ed. So academia is not necessarily designed for people of color. And so some of the things that interest us and what we wanna study isn't necessarily understood by the people who will end up being your advisor. Dr. Leiro's PhD path from the Bronx to BMCC professor wasn't an easy one. In fact, she calls it securitous. I grew up in the Castle Hill projects in the Bronx and I could not wait to get out the projects. And so I got a job after I graduated high school and I always wanted to be an attorney, but because I didn't want to go to college because I wanted to make money because I wanted to get out of the projects, I, um, I got a job at a law firm. And for me, that was like the next best thing. I was still in the world of law, even though I wasn't gonna practice law. And then um, a few years in, I was confronted by one of my bosses who said something very offensive to me. Um, and I can't remember what it was, but it was something of the gist, um, well, what do you know? You, you know, you just, you don't even have a college degree or like you just have high school. It was kind of one of those really condescending um, remarks. And I just remember thinking, I never again wanna be in a position where I have to swallow something like that. And so that week, I applied for college. A Boricua criminologist, Dr. Leiro started college at 27 and earned her PhD in criminal justice from the CUNY Graduate Center while obtaining her bachelor's and master's degrees from John Jay College. In the process, she balanced her ethnic and academic identity with ease. I purposefully wanted my identity as a Latina, Bronx-born, Puerto Rican to trump my identity as a PhD student because I felt that the main reason I wanted to teach is because I did want to be a face, a relatable face to my students so that they can see they can pursue higher education as well. And so it was important to me to be Boricua first and PhD student, right? And now I'm Dr. Boricua. <laughs> For Latinas, I'm Elena Romero. Millennial sisters Ileana and Andrea Salazar have been making waves in the world of fashion for over five years with their Seta apparel line. Their clients include Maluma, Thalia, and Carol G, to name a few. Let's take a look at their edgy designs right before New York's Fashion Week. Hi, my name is Ileana Salazar. Hi, my name is Andrea Salazar, and our brand is Zeta Apparel. Zeta, it's a very, like a dream came through because we are a fashion passionate. Uh, it comes in the blood because our mother and our grandmother were fashionistas. Zeta started in 2014 uh, as an Instagram page. Uh, we started doing the outfits and like, doing all the mix and match, and everybody went crazy about it. 
And then the first year was like super successful selling online. And then after a year, we decided to first our store, our first store in Medellin, Colombia. And we decided to open our first showroom in Miami. Like it was like a big step to go out from Colombia and then be in Miami. I think that was our signature. Every, everything was different. So everybody went like, oh my God, this is a unique piece. Our artisans in Colombia, they love what they do, so that's very important also to have people around you that passionate are passionate about You have to stay very creative all the time, like innovating, what are we gonna do? I think, I think it's not that hard. It's just something that people outside think that it's very hard. I mean, you have to work hard, but you have to follow your dreams. Everything is possible. We have been exploring for the last five years, and we have learned a lot, like the Latinas like to dress well. New York Fashion Week, it's like a door for a lot of new opportunities. Shakira and Jennifer Lopez will be headlining the halftime show during Super Bowl 54 next month in Miami. The last Latinas to grace the stage were Gloria Stefan in 1999, followed by Christina Aguilera in 2000. Since the Super Bowl is one of the most watched sporting events in the nation, having double Latina representation at halftime is bound to be one of the most memorable performances in the history of the game, and fans are already counting down to Super Bowl Sunday on February 2nd. Coincidentally, Game day is also Shakira's 42nd birthday, and she, along with J-Lo, are sure to bring down the house. Jennifer Lopez and Shakira are today's badass Latinas. Ecuadorian Saskia Sorrosa left her job as vice president of marketing at the NBA to launch Fresh Bellies, a baby food startup where she learned many lessons about entrepreneurship that her former 20-year career hadn't prepared her for. And that's why she's today's Latina on the Rise. My name is Saskia Sarosa. I'm the founder and CEO of Fresh Bellies. Uh, I came to the US when I was 17 years old to go to college in Washington, DC, and then I eventually stayed in the US and built my career here. I built a career in marketing for over 20 years. I started on the agency side, eventually went over to the National Basketball Association where I was working as a VP of marketing for 11 years. <laughs> After I had my first daughter is when this whole idea of starting Fresh Belly started swirling in my head. And then when I had my second daughter and I was on maternity leave uh, is when I realized there's still nothing in the space two years later. Somebody really has to do something with infant nutrition to get kids to just eat differently. And so I quit my job at the time and d dedicated myself to Fresh Bellies full time. The last the New England Journal of Medicine uh, predicts that 57% of kids will be obese by the age of 35. That's more than half of our youth. And so what we do is we focus on the moment when kids start, you know, take their very first bite of food, which is actually one of the most critical moments when we learn to eat as humans. We never mix our veggies with fruit. And then we also focus on vegetables that are bold in flavor. So. Swiss chard, which is like bitter, and beets, which are earthy, and broccoli, cauliflower and bell peppers, which are tangy. Um, so we focus on those bold flavors that we're gonna expect them to eat later on and start training those palates with every meal. When we were creating this, we, we didn't wanna be a pouch um, because pouches have been linked to childhood obesity. They're conducive to overfeeding because kids are just squeezing food in their mouth. And so we wanted to be convenient for on the go without being a pouch. Uh, and that's why each one of our cups comes with a spoon in the lid. Um, so we're still encouraging spoon feeding, which is a really important part of encouraging healthy eating habits. Moms can take it for on the go. They don't need to be looking through their diaper bag for a spoon, um, but we're still sort of creating that um, ceremonious thing around feeding mm. with a spoon. In a million dreams, I never thought I'd have an opportunity to be on the show and talk to the sharks and go through that experience. So um, it was a blessing. I mean, it was just something that I could have never even hoped for. There were a lot of really good questions that they made when we were talking to them, and there was a lot of interest in terms of what we were doing and how we plan to impact children. For us, our bigger goal was educating people about what we're doing and the fact that we got an opportunity to 
be in front of the, not only the sharks, but four million viewers to speak about our mission and why it's important is, it's just priceless. Raising capital is just really hard. Uh, and in this business, you need a lot of money. That's one of those things where you sometimes are like, I just want to throw my hands up and walk out. <laughs> I'm a female, I'm Latina, I'm selling baby food, I'm not selling this really sexy technology app. Um, and I'm pitching most of the time to men who normally respond by saying, I have no idea about childhood nutrition, my wife took care of that. Once you have your mind set on something, it's doable. You know, I'm one of many who, who have been able to do it, who have been able to raise capital and start a business. And um, the statistics are there. Female businesses are, are more successful than male businesses, even though they get less funding, only 2% of VC funding. Um, and so the stats are there. We have everything going for us to succeed. We just have to be willing to take the risk and work really hard for it. And that's our show for today. For more information on what you just saw, check out our website at tv.cuny.edu and follow our social media profiles. We love sharing our Latina stories with you. And please make sure you tune in next month where we'll meet fashionista Albania Rosario. We'll dig deep into the history of Afro-Latinidad and so much more. Make sure you tune in. Hasta la próxima. Bye-bye.